Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's A Spark. I'm Junior Doan. Thank you for joining us. My guest today is cardio-oncologist, advanced heart failure cardiologist, and assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University in New York. Welcome, Dr. Reichel Kerr. I'm delighted to have you here today because I get to learn about what's new in cancer, specifically in cardiovascular oncology. But before we get there, I would like to hear from you, what can people expect now in cases of cardiovascular problems? Are there transplants? Are there alternates? What's the what from your point of view? And then we'll move on. Okay, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, in, you know, when we're talking about 2023, it's really exciting to see that over the years and decades, we've made a lot of progress in treating patients with heart disease. Now, we're specifically talking today about cancer and heart disease, and cancer therapy can cause several specific heart problems, whether it's weakness of the heart muscle, like congestive heart failure, blockages or spasm of the arteries that supply the heart, or actual abnormal heart rhythms. And we can treat these with the use of medications, sometimes procedures, and there are certain patients, sometimes cancer survivors, who develop very advanced heart failure, which we can uh, carry out procedures like heart transplantation or heart pumps to help the heart, called an LVAD. So it's really a spectrum of disease which we are able to treat with multiple modalities. Is this terribly new or has it been around for a couple of years? Well, the field of cardio-oncology is a relatively new specialty. It was in the late 1960s or early 70s that some of the first patients who were children who had leukemia were treated with a drug called doxorubicin or adriamycin and unfortunately were found to develop congestive heart failure. This was really the first incidence where we knew that cancer treatment was causing heart disease. Over the years, there have been multiple cancer treatments, including radiation therapy, targeted therapies, and even immunotherapy or using the immune system to fight the cancer that have all been shown to have certain cardiac side effects. And so I would say this is a relatively new specialty and we're really learning more every day to help treat these patients. How do you learn? Well, we learn from the experience and also the work of many, many people in the field. And there's not one person who can do this alone. Cardio-oncology by definition is a multidisciplinary collaborative specialty in which the cardiologists, the cancer doctors or the oncologists the radiation oncologists, the surgeons, we all work together using cutting edge um, details from the latest research, as well as our own patient experiences to make sure that we can help get that patient through their cancer therapy and do, yell, uh, do well for years thereafter. So does that mean it's basically at a major medical center or can you do telemedicine for part of this? Since the COVID pandemic, Across the United States, telemedicine has been utilized tremendously. And so it's usually a combination. I personally do like to meet each patient personally at the first visit, but there's circumstances that we are able to use telemedicine as well once they've completed their testing. So it's usually a mix of the two to make sure we can take care of that patient appropriately. Have you discovered a role of DNA in this? And so what we're seeing is that there are certain patients who are predisposed to develop heart problems and some of those patients who are developing, especially weakness of the heart muscle, congestive heart failure, may actually have a genetic mutation that is predisposing them to that problem. And so we're actually looking into these patients if we can decipher early on if they're going to be predisposed to developing these problems. We're not at a stage where yet where we can go and change the DNA or block certain characteristics. We don't want to flower, are we or not? I, I don't really know anything about that other than what I read. 
Well, over the last 20 years, I can say that there's been tremendous progress in this field. I won't say that it's a routine therapy now, but there are certain methods, especially a technology known as the CRISPR technology that's used in certain specific fields. Oh, yes. The DNA. Now, with regards to cardio-oncology, it's not commonly used, but there are certain disorders uh, that can cause heart disease and forms of cancer, like amyloidosis, where these are being investigated. So I'm excited to be a part of the medical field, and I hope in the next few years and definitely in the next few decades, we'll be utilizing technologies to help the patients. What are you concentrating in your own research? What part of, what slice of this? There are several things we're working on, but in addition to taking care of cancer patients, who have heart disease or develop heart disease, I'm also a cardiologist that takes care of patients who develop advanced heart failure, those with the sickest hearts. And some of those patients undergo heart transplantation. So I work at one of these centers at Columbia, which is one of the largest centers for patients who have had heart transplantation. Unfortunately, these patients, after five to seven years, the number one cause of death in these patients is actually cancer, because we use medications to knock down the immune system that helps to protect their heart transplant. But unfortunately, reducing their immune system leads to the increased risk of certain cancers, such as lymphoma or colon cancer. So our work is to try to identify how we can prevent these cancers from happening, and if they do happen, how we can adequately treat these patients. How do you do that? Well, just as we were talking about early, we're looking into those specifically cancer survivors. Now, we looked at our, our whole cohort of patients who had heart transplantation here at Columbia, and about 8% of them had a history of cancer. And we found that these groups of patients are at much higher risk of developing subsequent cancers after their transplant. And so we try to be very aggressive in surveillance to try to find cancers early and potentially also reducing the amount of immunosuppression if we can safely do so to prevent those cancers from occurring. But there's certainly a lot more work that we're working on that potentially we could be better to treat these patients. Do you have enough information now to know the role of attitude on the doctor or the patient's part to help or hinder success? Well, there is emerging research that we know that stress in itself can be a risk factor, both for heart disease and cancer. There are certain hormones which are secreted, which can make your outcomes worse. And so we know that mental health is very important, if not equally important to physical health. So this is certainly a uh, part of medicine, which there have been developments, which years ago, we really never paid as much attention to it. But certainly we have to look at everyone holistically, both the mental health as well as the physical condition. So I, I had B-cell lymphoma about 12 years ago and uh, Morton Coleman was my oncologist. And I just loved his attitude. <laughs> you know, I was scared till they found out enough. Uh, and I found out later it was only by a few years that it was possible to treat me that in earlier times, no possibility. So that was, you know, got my attention. But his attitude, uh, I took as a patient when I was feeling vulnerable after the fourth chemotherapy, when I was feeling weak, uh, I took his energy in as a way of uh, compensating for my loss of physical energy. Until that, I was going to parties, but as I got weaker, I couldn't. And it got me to think about it's really a partnership, and then it's beyond just the technical. Have you noticed anything like that, or was just that personal to me? No, I think this is a very important point. For us, it's really not just our job to get the best treatment for the patient, to really form a friendship with that patient and be their guide and develop trust. Um, the patients, they're, you know, just as you are, and that's an inspiring story, and I'm happy that things are going well, are in a vulnerable position. They're in a position where, you know, we don't know what each day will bring, and that's really our responsibility. And we're very grateful when we're able to develop that bond of trust and to help to navigate that patient through those troubled times to get them to a better place that we hope that they'll get to. And so I think it's really key, especially in the modern era of technology, that we do have that relationship and develop a bond as a provider with the patient. What is the role of complementary medicine? I remember, I think it was Sloan Kettering had a one of those buildings dedicated to it, and I, I went up for like a massage, but I was really too weak to get there on a regular basis. But um, are there any other supplementary treatments that you found to be helpful, not helpful, just relaxing? What do you tell your patients? You know, I'm not 
primarily uh, someone who works with uh, complementary medicine, but I do know that there's certainly a lot of things that have not been investigated that may help patients. For example, um, I take care of patients who have congestive heart failure, and there are certain signals that beetroot juice may have some potential to improve the health of those patients. So I would say that there is some promising therapies in this field, but is it, it is important um, in conjunction with a healthcare provider to make sure that they're safe. But there's certainly a role for certain therapies, and it's always good to run those by the healthcare professional to see if it's a fit for each patient. So what about radio frequencies or energy treatments or things we don't really think of? Does uh, Have you read about or do you know of anyone who practices or thinks that's an important part of the team or not really? Uh, it's not something that I deal with uh, commonly. Um, specifically, I have dealt with patients who had the radiation therapy uh, to treat cancer who have had heart problems. But uh, specifically with uh, radiotherapy, as you're referring to, I, I don't have personal experience with that. Okay. And what got you interested in this field? Well, that's a great question. Uh, when I was a resident up at uh, the University of Massachusetts, at the end of our residency, we all present a particular case that we found interesting or something that we felt needs further research. And I was a second year resident and I was taking care of a patient who had colon cancer who was given chemotherapy and developed uh, a heart attack and congestive heart failure at the time. And we took that patient, we moved her to the ICU. We were able to get a good outcome for this patient many years ago. Um, and then when, you know, towards the end of the year, I really thought about that, that this patient who was suffering from one, a cancer was developing two, a heart problem. And that was a lot for the patient to deal with. And so I thought it would be a field that needs further research and one that I would be excited to be a part of. And that's why I did a fellowship in actual cardio oncology and further in congestive heart failure to further understand this disease process. And now that's really my specialty. And those are the patients I see in clinic. And I, I hope we can improve the care of those patients. You were lucky to find a course or a, a teacher that could help you at that, at that point. Yes, I, I think in the medical profession, as in any other profession, uh, we really you know, are standing on the shoulder of the giants. And those giants are our members. And my mentor in cardio-oncology was Dr. Jennifer Liu. Uh, who's now the head of uh, cardio-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. And it's really without these mentors, we really wouldn't be able to be in the position we are today. Could you describe what a mentor actually does? Uh, does the intern or does the student spend a lot of time with you when you do grand rounds or conferences or teaching moments? Or just describe what it means to mentor or be mentored and be mentored. So a mentor is someone who is going to help develop your career. And we do this every day just by, you know, in clinic, we have, um, we are able to rotate when you're a resident or a fellow with uh, senior physicians and learn the way that they really approach each case and what their strategy is to improve the care. This happens both as an outpatient as well as as an inpatient when patients are admitted to the CCU um, in the critical care unit or the regular floor. Mentorship also includes research mentorship and mentors really show you how to develop a clinical question and bring that clinical question into a study and see you know, the approach to make sure that you get meaningful results from the work that you're doing. So mentorship is key. Um, I would not be here certainly without my mentors, Dr. Jennifer Liu and Dr. Nir Uriel, who I work with here at Columbia in this field. Do you come from a family that is interested in science or medicine? Actually, yes. Uh, so my parents immigrated from India years ago, and they came to the United States and completed their training in medicine. So I really grew up um, in rural Arizona. Uh, they had a clinic out there, and my father is a retired surgeon, and my mother is a retired pediatrician. So I certainly was exposed to the wonderful field of medicine at a young age, and um, I really don't think I would be here today uh, without their guidance and mentorship from that young age. What do you think they taught you by way of values? What was, I have an Indian friend and she said when she was growing up, her father told her she could be an engineer or physician. That's it, choose. Uh, did your family emphasize that kind of thing or not? Well, I do think, especially the immigration pattern to the United States, that there was a focus in early generations on these two fields. And uh, I mean, come from a family of physicians, I kind of took to that naturally. Um, I really was interested in myself in that, but I do think over the years that is changing. And so um, a lot of my fellow Indian Americans are going into um, 
several other fields and not just medicine, but um, there are quite a few that went into medicine. Interesting. Well, it is interesting. You know, there's so many things you can control in life, but a lot of things you can't control. And, uh, you know, luck plays a, a part. Opportunity comes, opportunity goes, you know, challenges come, how you treat them, all of that is uh, good. I'm always concerned about hospitals being a sort of a center of germs, <laughs> which, you know, if you survive them, it's fine. But if you're sick and run down in the cardio reasons or others, you're more vulnerable. Is there any new in, in, in keeping things truly clean? I'm, I mean, for example, even wearing the white coat from patient to patient to patient, are you carrying anything around with you? Or do you spritz yourself with uh, hand sanitizer? Part of working in a hospital making, is making sure that we're adhering to those protocols, right, to keep patients safe. And so every time we go into a room, it's washing your hands, which is one of the most important things possible, using sanitizers. Uh, certain patients who may have infections that travel in other ways, we sometimes have to have what's called contact precautions and wear a gown. Uh, sometimes we have to wear a specific mask, which I think many people who are not physicians are now aware of the N95 mask after that COVID pandemic. Right. So it is our responsibility in the hospital to make sure that we're adhering to all those principles to make sure we reduce that rate of transmission within the hospital. So how do you keep yourself fresh, which is, means inner calm? Yeah, this is this is a great question. In medicine, there are many things. There can be stressful moments, but I really remember our patients that have done well. And when I think about those patients that have done well, it really revitalizes me and inspires me to make sure that we're doing the best we can for our other patients to get them to that space. So anytime I may feel down or we're having a tough day, I, I remember those um, who are doing well, and it really brings me a lot of energy to make sure we can do the same for our other patients. Are there certain kinds of uh, personalities in patients that respond better to treatment, have you noticed? I'm not aware of specific uh, research with regards to that. But I, you know, I do think it's good for a patient and there can be tough times to try to remain positive uh, with the treatments, make sure that all their you know, anxieties and questions are adequately answered by the physician to make sure they have that confidence to go ahead with the treatment. So I think the key thing there is, as you were talking about earlier, Junia, is developing that relationship of trust to make sure that the patient feels comfortable proceeding with the treatment and is aware of all that's going on. And I think that really does help the patient to get through that journey whether it's cancer treatment or subsequent heart disease. When you meet a new patient, how do you develop that trust between you two? Especially at the first visit, we spend um, you know, about 45 minutes to an hour getting to know that patient and not just the medical details. Obviously, that's how we start and we go through all that in tremendous detail. But we also understand, you know, want to understand where the patient's coming from, what their hopes are, um, what they what their hobbies are. Um, we try to understand not just the medicine, but also the patient itself. And you know, once we know what the patient's hopes and desires are, what they're worried about, uh, what they do for fun, I ask every patient that I see in the clinic, what do you do for fun? And sometimes you can relate on something, whether it's travel, sports, television. And I really, that adds the human element to the, to the medicine. And medicine, one of my professors when I was um, in medical school told me that, you know, it is a science, but it, it is as much an art as well. And so I really looked up to folks who really developed that bond with their patients. I think you have that ability to get people to trust you. It, there's something about you that feels receptive, inviting, and attentive. And I, I want to share that because I think not everybody has it, whether or not they mean it. And it's a wonderful attribute for you to have in your profession when so much of people's future is literally in your hand and your brain and, you know, feeling good and trusting sometimes gets you through challenging moments or more than moments. So do you see the field changing in the next 10 years? Well, first of all, thank you for that uh, compliment, Junior. It really means a lot. And that's really our goal to make sure that we can bond with our patients and try to get them the best results possible. On um, the second question, absolutely. Uh, it is exciting times with regards to technology, the advent of artificial intelligence and you know the progress that we're seeing in genetics as well. 
will certainly change the way medicine is practiced. So it is exciting and it is important as we've been talking that we're able to balance that to make sure that we continue to maintain that bond with patients and that bond of trust uh, to make sure we get the best outcomes for them. One of the things that challenges in my personal life is patience. I'm simply a, not a patient person and I've had to inculcate that and I'm much better and more accepting of delays, which I now <laughs> incorporate as other opportunities than what I originally thought. But um, how do you get into a clinical trial? Uh, if you're a patient and you or your mother feels she has cancer or something like that, or it's been identified and you've gone to the ends, I had an assistant whose mother had cancer and we looked around for a trial she got into but the specs for the it was just too late and we didn't really know what to do earlier or how to do it what are the options now uh if you want to if, if your physician can't help you about uh current trial or trials you might qualify for now, this is a great question. There's you know, tremendous progress in the field of medicine, and a lot of that progress is in the form of randomized clinical trials. I would say it's always best to approach um, the medical professional, and uh, it is our duty to update you about what is the latest in the field and which clinical trials are available that would be applicable to each patient. Uh, having said that, if um, the patient feels that there may be other options that were not discussed, there is, you know, online resources for that, many um, uh, through government websites about active clinical trials that are in this space. So I would always first ask the medical professionals um, if we feel that that's inadequate, then online resources to try to find the latest clinical trials specific to that cancer or heart disease. For example, we have multiple uh, clinical trials with regards to heart disease and congestive heart failure that we work with, and we always screen each patient to see if they would be an adequate candidate for the same. And I know my colleagues in oncology are very active doing the, the same thing. One of the things I learned, or I think I've learned, is that a lot of medicine is, as they say, an art, and that means experimental is just to improve it or personalities the way they, they do things. But um, would you advise getting a second opinion for your potential clients? Not that they would suspect you, but more if they went to the Cleveland Clinic or whatever other places there are, they might have a slightly different approach or technique, or is that not even a good question? Well, no, there's no such thing as a, as a not good question, Julia. And these are all oh, important Oh, I love questions. that. Thank you. I'm sure that patients have this question in mind, right? If the question came to you, that means someone has this question in mind. I'm very confident, for example, in my hospital at Columbia with regards to the care that we provide and the options that we offer each patient. But certainly if you're a patient, uh, whichever hospital you're in, and if you feel that those needs have not been addressed, you're really, it is your right to look for a second opinion. Um, hopefully that's not the case in most of the cases, but um, we feel very confident in our abilities and I'm sure many colleagues in other hospitals do the same, but it is the right of a patient if they feel that their um, actual issues are not being addressed to look into a second opinion. How would they know they're not being addressed? If you're a civilian, so to speak, if you're not in the medical profession, how would you know? This hopefully does not happen often, and I think this would be an uh, uncommon sort of scenario where someone um, would require you know, a second opinion. But in that setting, usually that would happen if a, a patient uh, either is not feeling that they get the care that they thought they would expect at a particular facility. I always look at the team. Who's in the office? <laughs> How are things run? <laughs> Who does this person hire? You know, uh, I think because you're always dealing with the team one way or another. Um, so I'm I'm doing that, uh, but maybe that's not the best way to do it. From a patient's point of view, how would you evaluate an office or a physician or anything like that? Well, that comes back to the human element, um, and that are all the you know things that you would expect. You have good communication with the physician. Have things been explained in a way that makes sense um, to make sure that you're getting the best treatment possible? Have all options been discussed? And to make sure that everything is explained to you in a language which you understand. I think those are kind of the basic things that every patient um, would look for. 
Thank you. The one other thing I want to mention, and really a compliment to Dr. Coleman, is that um, after I was treated, you know, you go back twice a year and then eventually once a year. But in those meetings, if I mentioned anything that he thought needed to follow up that wasn't directly in his specialty, he would, in the office with me, call up the person, get her on the phone or him on the phone, the doctor, and say, got a patient here, want you to see him or her, do it. And that's what happened. And a lot of the people I'm connected with turned out to be because of his approach. But I don't, you know, I don't know that, I don't believe that's a common approach, but it's a full human being approach. It's building out what you were talking about, send, setting a bond. So anyway, I'm planting that as a seed just for you and others to do. But I oh, need absolutely. to wrap it up. I'm so grateful that you agreed to talk and we talked about your en enthusiasm, your family, and your dedication to helping people who are really suffering. And then there's an interaction or an interrelationship between cardio, severe cardio problems and cancer treatments. Getting on top of that is really good. And the important role of the physician in creating in that bubble of fear, anxiety, and trust, hope. I think you give people, as I said, a confidence in you and, and the system uh, that they're going to be part of, and that's a gift. So thank you. And remember everybody, go out and do something kind and something for someone you know and someone you don't know every day. Okay, see you next time. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.